This is episode seven of the Magic Detective Podcast. On this episode, we talk about Houdini's time in Washington, D.C., specifically when he testified before Congress. That and more on the Magic Detective Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Magic Detective Podcast. I'm your host, Dean Carnegie. I am the Magic Detective, and this is episode seven. And we've got uh, an interesting program in store for you. But before we do that, I thought I would just cover a couple things. Of course, this is episode seven, as I said, so I've gotten six episodes out of the way. And they've been... um, They've been fun to do. It's, uh, I guess I'm finding my, uh, what's the term? I'm finding my sea legs. I'm getting used to doing these podcasts now. First few were a little bumpy, but I knew I'd get it eventually. And I appreciate the, the various comments that I've received from people in regards to the, uh, the content and how much they liked the program. I would encourage you, if you do like the program, to share it with others. Let other people know about the the uh, Magic Detective Podcast. And subscribe. Please do subscribe because you will automatically get the latest editions uh, in your uh, podcasting device, whether it's an iPhone or whatever it is. You'll get them instantly. So you'll get them before everyone else. So I'd love for you to do that. I think episode one, I mentioned something about the Magic Detective Podcast being maybe the first or only magic history podcast available. I have since discovered that that is not true. It wasn't a lie. It was just, I didn't know any better. I did find another podcast that covers magic history. It looks like that one is closed or, or has, they have stopped producing ep- episodes. However, it looked like they were going pretty strong in 2017, but then it uh, stopped in December of 2017 and they haven't had another episode since. So I may be the only Magic History podcast available. I don't know. There could be another one out there that I still haven't found. But uh, I hope you enjoy the history of magic, uh, the history of entertainment, I like to think of it as. And today, uh, Houdini rears his head again. And I'm doing this for a couple reasons. One, because uh, tomorrow in the United States, we have a big election that, depending upon who you talk to, could be the end of the world. And I believe they said that with the 2016 election as well. It could be the end of the world. And then before that, the 2014 election, the end of the world. So apparently, if you believe politicians, the end of the world is right around the corner. And I tend to think that if you do believe politicians, the end of the world is around the corner, closer than you think. I don't uh, trust them. Today, we're talking about uh, Houdini uh, when he testified before Congress. Before I get into that, though, I want to mention something that I did earlier this year in 2018. I had the uh, opportunity to actually appear in a documentary about Houdini, and they were talking about, coincidentally enough, Houdini in Congress. So we filmed the... uh, the documentary in Washington, D.C. It was a lot of fun to do. Well, the only the only little caveat here is it was a French documentary. So I'm an international documentary star, but I guess you haven't seen it here in the States. Oh, well. And, and I'll be honest, I don't even think my episode has appeared as of yet. So the moment it does, I will let everyone know. So let's get into this. Let's get into the day uh, or the time that Houdini testified before Congress. It was 1926. Houdini had stepped away from his role as a magician and escape artist, showman and actor. And he does something that was rare for an entertainer. He, He testifies before Congress. This was the ultimate act of attacking the fake spiritualists. And oddly, the bill before Congress was an anti-fortune telling bill. Yeah. Fortune telling. Yeah. I thought Houdini was going after fake spirit mediums. Uh, mm, hmm. Okay. The spiritualists were not happy to be lumped into, uh, with so-called gypsy fortune tellers, even though many of them ran in the same circles. Here's an interesting thing I found out from an issue of Stanion's magic in the early 20th century, spirit mediums began to refer to themselves by a new name. Uh, and I, <laughs> I hope I pronounced this right. Psychist 
or yeah, I think that's it. Psychist. It's P S Y C H I S T. Psychist. This word means someone who believes in psychic phenomenon. So they hadn't quite gotten to psychic yet. So they were at psychist. Uh, of course, in the later part of the 20th century, we would refer to all these folks as psychics and psychic mediums. They apparently read your mind, and could tell the future. The bill before Congress was House Resolution 8989, and it was sponsored by Saul Bloom of New York. It would prohibit all forms of fortune-telling within the D.C. limits, the District of Columbia, Washington, D.C. Several other states and localities had similar laws uh, that they were using successfully. So here was an attempt by Congress to implement the same thing in the district. Now, Saul Bloom, Saul Bloom has an interesting history. A couple episodes ago, I was talking about, it was I think it was my, what did I call it, the Beginner's Guide to Houdini or something. I think it was episode five. And I mentioned in there that Houdini performed at the Columbian Exposition, also known as the Chicago World's Fair. He performed there on the Midway as the Houdini brothers. Well, here's a bit of trivia that's pretty fascinating. This fellow, Congressman Saul Bloom, has a background in entertainment. Not only that, he was responsible for creating the Midway at the Chicago World's Fair. And among the entertainers, like I just mentioned, was Houdini. Uh, An article that appeared in the October 16th, 1942 edition of the Washington Post mentions that Saul Bloom actually had an interest in magic. In fact, the title of the article is Master Magician of Capitol Hill. So if you're going to propose a bill about stopping spiritualists in D.C., and you know you can't do that because the spiritualists claim it's a religion— and they have protection under the Constitution, then you take a slightly less direct route and go after fortune-telling and write the bill in such a way that you could snag the fake spirit mediums along the way. I guess this is the plan. And if you're going to do that, who better to call for advice and knowledge than the number one spirit debunker in the country, Harry Houdini. And it seems clear that the two must have known each other, which, as I mentioned, they did. And on the uh, rare chance that they didn't meet at the Chicago World's Fair, which we know they did, they surely met while Bloom was representing gentleman Jim Corbett, who was a boxer. Houdini was in the, uh, the lineup with Corbett during a 1917 benefit show to raise money for the war effort. So one way or another, Houdini knows Saul Bloom before all this began. The first day of the meetings was February 26th, 1926. The proceedings started about 10.30 in the morning, and according to the congressional record, when the proceedings begun, the bill was read before the committee. And here is how the bill reads. Any person pretending to tell fortunes for reward or compensation where lost or stolen goods may be found, any person who, by game or device, sleight of hand, pretending, fortune-telling, or by any trick or other means, by the use of cards or other implements or instruments, fraudulently obtains from another person money or property or reward, property of any description, any person pretending to remove spells or to sell charms for protection or to unite the separated shall be considered a disorderly person. Any person violating the provisions of this law shall be punished by a fine not to exceed $250 or by imprisonment not to exceed six months or by both such fine and imprisonment. So reads the bill. Then Congressman Bloom addresses the committee. He's asked numerous questions, and there seems to be much debate on the proper placement of commas and such. Then they begin to grill him on content. There's a humorous exchange between Congressman Reed and Congressman Bloom. Reed begins with, What is telling a fortune? Bloom, well, uh, telling a fortune is to make people believe what the future is, to give you a picture that you are going to marry a blonde, for example. Reed, how do you know you won't? Bloom, I want to tell you something. I'm serious about this thing, and I don't want any kidding or joking from you. Reed, Uh, that's the sad part of it. After much bantering and bickering, Houdini, who may have arrived late, is welcomed before the committee. He answers questions in regards to his qualifications, and then he makes his opening statement. He begins with, 
This is positively no attack upon religion. Please understand that emphatically. I am not attacking a religion. I respect every genuine believer in spiritualism or in any other religion, as long as it does not conflict with the laws of the country or laws of humanity. But this thing they call spiritualism, wherein a medium intercommunicated with the dead, it's a fraud from start to finish. There are only two kinds of mediums, those who are mental degenerates and who ought to be under observation, and those who are deliberate cheats and frauds. I would not believe a medium under oath. Perjury means nothing to them. And so it began. Houdini was not holding anything back. After his opening statement, the committee asks him questions. Congressman Rathbone asks Houdini if he has read the bill. Houdini replies he has read it eight or nine times. Then it's pointed out to Houdini that the bill never mentions spiritualism. They even direct a question to Houdini. Is there anything in this bill that deals with spiritualism? Houdini says yes. Clearly, the committee is confused. And they ask Houdini, will you be good enough to point out to me where the bill deals with spiritualism? Houdini follows with saying that under the guise of a, being a medium, they will tell fortunes. He makes the claim that mediums are clairvoyants, and in D.C., the government gives licenses to clairvoyants for $25. He further goes on to say that there should be no distinction between fortune tellers and mediums as, in his mind, they are one in the same. Then Houdini continues with describing some of the ways mediums operate, including wrapping themselves under the cloak of religion. They quote from the Bible. Houdini points out that he can refute any interpretation that they make in regards to biblical matters. Then Mr. Rathbone asks Houdini if he is actually attacking spiritualism. Because let's face it, <laughs> That's exactly what it sounds like. I was fortunate enough to read the actual transcripts from the February 26th, 1926 uh, events, and um, they're just, they're fascinating. On one hand, Houdini is claiming the bill says a great deal of things that, on the other hand, uh, quite frankly, the, the bill doesn't. For example, the bill never mentions mediums or spiritualism. Yet, uh, to Houdini's mind, the very fact that the bill says any person who, by game or device, sleight of hand, pretending, fortune-telling, or any other means, blah, 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 shall be considered a disorderly person. So to Houdini, even though it doesn't mention it, uh, or, um, or mediums, he says, nope, no, nope, that covers it, that's it. He even declares as much. When he's questioned about the difference between fraudulent versus genuine spiritualist ministers, Congressman Bloom, the bill's sponsor, says the bill is only to weed out those who are bogus. More than once, it is suggested that the bill be redrafted to include some of the language that Houdini and Bloom are claiming is there, but is not. Others on the committee are frustrated that this bill makes them all look ridiculous. Imagine that, a congressman thinking that they look ridiculous. Hmm. Congressman Bloom points out that a similar bill was held constitutional by the state of New York, and Congressman Gilbert follows with, constitutional, yes, but ridiculous. As the session is nearing the end, Congressman Hammer speaks up and says to Houdini, I didn't understand what your occupation is. Now that line, that's right from the transcript. That cracks me up. So here's a congressman, supposed to be uh, the representative of the people, has no idea who one of the most popular entertainers uh, of his generation is. No clue. And actually, from the transcripts, it doesn't look like uh, that congressman was alone. Uh, a lot of them had no uh, no clue who Houdini was. So um, Houdini, though, he, he answers with this classic line. I just love this. He says, I am a syndicate writer. I am an author. I am a mystifier, which means I am an illusionist. I call it mystification, but I do tricks that nobody can explain. And there is some conjecture about Houdini claiming really real powers, which he flatly denies. Uh, he points out that others say he has powers, but he has never made such claims. Then Congressman Hammer makes a really astute observation. He says, These people claim they have divine power. Don't you think it's very difficult to do anything along the lines of stopping them? I'm talking to you. You have a religion, and I ask you whether, under our form of government, if we ought to not 
go very slowly before we enact legislation along this line. I, I want some sort of bill. This bill or the New York law or something, uh, I'm in, in favor of amending and making stronger the law to prevent these things you have exposed in doing which you have performed a great service. Although you are rather severe in your strictures of those who disagree with you. This is all addressed at Houdini. Several of the members did think that the, uh, the, the bill itself was worthwhile, but they knew that they were dangerously close to prohibiting religious liberties, and any such bill would, would be tossed away on those grounds alone. The final person who was brought up to testify was a Mrs. Jane B. Coates, the head of the American Order of the White Cross Society and ordained spiritualist minister. She had a very, very clever angle. She pointed out that the bill made no reference to mediums who give spiritual advice, and that the bill should include language protecting the rights of spiritualists to give interviews to members of their own congregations or to those who come to them in trouble and sorrow and needing advice. Then she further said their method of pay should be protected as well. Basically, what she was doing was she was trying to completely flip this bill on its head and have it say the exact opposite of what Houdini and Bloom wanted. It was clever. Mrs. Coates got into a discussion with Congressman Bloom on fake mediums versus real, and she, she said she could not trust anyone that wasn't a mystic, to be able to identify those who are fake. Congressman McLeod asks, is Mr. Houdini a mystic? Mrs. Coates replies, I think Mr. Houdini is one of the greatest mystics the world possesses today. And Congressman Bloom says, but he says he's not. And Mrs. Coates follows with, Mr. Houdini denies everyone's statement that is not on his side of the case. Despite Houdini trying to butt in and get his two cents back in in the game, uh, the session was closed due to time. Houdini would have a couple months to reevaluate and prepare for his next meeting, which would take place on May 18, 1926. During the first day of the Senate hearings on the anti-fortune-telling bill, the big revelation was that there were members of Congress and their wives who often visited and consulted with mediums and fortune tellers. It was also brought up that even the White House was known to consult these kind of people. Here was information I'm sure the D.C. class didn't want to get out, but it did. And I wonder if that's why the second day of hearings wasn't until the end of May, because they were hoping people would forget. On May 18, 1926, the congressional hearings for H.R. 8989 resumed the hearings began by hearing testimony from Remigius Weiss of Philadelphia. Weiss, no relation to Houdini's family, was an investigator into mediums and spirit phenomenon. He was another of the many investigators working for and or with Houdini. Weiss shared how he had exposed the fame Henry Slade and even got Slade to sign a confession. The name of Conan Doyle was also brought up during the testimony, and the congressmen were under the belief that Conan Doyle was a great authority on spiritualism. Moments later, Houdini addresses the congressman in regards to Doyle. Mr. McLeod again reiterates that Conan Doyle was an authority on spiritualism. Houdini jumps in and says, Conan Doyle is not an outstanding authority. McLeod responds, he is accepted as one of the best, and Houdini follows with, no, he is not accepted as one of the best. He is one of the greatest dupes outside of Sir Oliver Lodge. Conan Doyle stated, I possess mediumistic powers, which I deny. McLeod says, how can you prove it? Houdini replied, I admit that I do not have mediumistic powers. They claim in a London psychic college I dematerialized my body and that I ooze through and come out again and put myself together. McLeod follows with, uh, how do you do it? And Houdini says something which is quite remarkable. I do it like anybody else would do it. There's nothing secret about it. We are all humans. Nobody is super normal. We are all born alike. Uh, boy, that isn't an evasive uh, comment. I have never heard one. Uh, so 
I would do it like anybody else would do it. That is a great statement. But as far as there being nothing secret about it, you, you bet there are secret things about it. Houdini's not giving his secrets away. Then Congressman Bloom, one of the resolution's authors, says, Have you ever heard of another city in the United States that has a similar law to the one in the District of Columbia in regards to fortune telling? Houdini then explains that no city gives such a cheap license to fortune tellers and, in fact, most cities actually have laws prohibiting it. Of those cities that do offer a license, they have fees like $1,500 per year, $1,000 per year, $5 per day, $500 per quarter, and $150 per month, whereas the District of Columbia charges a mere $25 per year. Next to testify would be Rose Mackenberg. She would again open up that source of embarrassment for quite a few congressmen, which was first revealed in February. Rose had visited two of the mediums in the audience, Madam Marcia and Reverend Jane Coates, prior to the day's proceedings. She visited them separately, but a key bit of information was shared by both mediums. That devastating bit of information was that congressmen, often visited mediums in town. Not only that, they included the White House among their group of spiritualism devotees, and then she mentions that Senator Fletcher's wife is a medium herself. By the way, in case I hadn't mentioned it, Rose Mackenberg was an undercover agent of sorts working for Houdini. She often went in to expose fake spiritualists. She was quite a Quite a, uh, a young lady. So this revelation also includes the clue to a question I've heard for a while. That question is, how do all these mediums and fortune tellers know about the hearings in order to show up? Well, along with the fact that many congressmen attend seances or get readings, Reverend Jane Coates also mentions that she has been lobbying congressmen and had interviewed 22 of them, and 16 were entirely favorable towards spiritualism. Obviously, with members of Congress being so friendly with the spiritualist community, it's easy to see who told the mediums about the hearing. It was the congressman. Reading Rose Mackenberg's testimony is certainly fascinating, but I'd like to share with you now testimony from the other side. No, not from the spirits, but rather from one of the spiritualists. On May 20th, 1926, Reverend H.P. Strack, secretary of the Nationals Spiritualists Association of America, gives his testimony. What he tries to do is shred the statements made by previous speakers. He began with Remigius Weiss's testimony about Dr. Henry Slade. Reverend Strack says, In the testimony given by the man from Philadelphia, who was Weiss, he refers to a seance conducted by the medium named Slade. If the committee will remember, in this man's testimony, he stated the medium would take his foot and kick a book, and the book would remain floating in in the air. This is concrete evidence of mediumship, the law of levitation, forcing a book to remain in the air that has been kicked by a medium. Now, let's look at what Weiss really said. A book extended over the edge of the table. Dr. Slade slyly gave the book a kick with his left foot from under the table. The book turned over like the flap of a door. There is nothing remarkable in this trick. Still, up to this time, spiritualists say Dr. Slade floated a book in the air. Hmm. So Weiss actually showed that Slade's attempt to float a book was actually done by secretly kicking the book and that it merely flipped over. It did not float in the air. And despite this, the spiritualists claim the book floated, not Weiss, who again exposed it. So Reverend Strack was misleading in this part of his testimony. Strack also mentions a curious exchange that took place during the Senate hearings. The speaker had mentioned that Houdini claimed that all of these mediums were fakes and frauds and asked if he would include the Davenport brothers in that statement. Houdini replied, The reason I have not included the Davenport brothers was because they are personal friends of mine. And I am a student of Dana Davenport. 
Now, I haven't been able to uh, check this against the actual record, but it's fairly obvious that Houdini simply didn't want to include his friends in all this nonsense. The Davenports never claimed to be real mediums. They also never claimed that they weren't. Houdini said the Davenports shared their secret rope tie with him. And uh, at this point, though, in time, this point in time, they were no longer performing, so it didn't really matter. I'm not sure who Dana Davenport is. I have a feeling that Dana Davenport was just, um, the stenographer took the name down wrong or misunderstood when Houdini said it. And, uh, unfortunately it's there for, uh, for all time, but, um, the name is incorrect. The two brothers were Ira Erastus Davenport and William Henry Davenport. A curious moment happens when President Abraham Lincoln's name is brought up. Lincoln seems to be a favorite spirit among mediums, as he has a habit of showing up in many so-called seances. The spiritualist communities often point to Lincoln himself as being a devoted spiritualist. Houdini at one point decided to squelch this statement by bringing up uh, into evidence a letter that he had from Lincoln's son, Robert Todd Lincoln, denying that his father was ever a believer in spiritualism. Mary Todd Lincoln was the believer. Some of the additional highlights from the proceedings include Houdini giving a demonstration of spirit voices speaking through a trumpet, which was well received by the congressman. A bit later, one congressman mentions a stunt that Houdini did where he was blindfolded and drove around town and he would stop the vehicle and retrieve a missing object. This is uh, what we know today as a blindfold drive, although I was under the impression that Houdini didn't really like to drive, so I wonder if maybe there was a driver and Houdini was blindfolded and, and you know, kind of directed him from there. At a later point in the proceedings, Houdini gives a demonstration of slate writing, which he prefaces that anyone can do. In other words, it's not supernatural. He shows two school slates and the numbers one, two, three and four are written on the respective sides of the slates to show that they contain no other writing, no other message. Then the numbers are cleaned off and the two slates tied together with a handkerchief and a piece of chalk is placed between them. Next, Houdini produces a dictionary that was purchased that very morning and asks a member of Congress to drop a card within the pages of the book, so marking a page. He comically asks the spirits to tell him the number of the page the first word in the book, and some sentence that he could not possibly know. And sure enough, when he unties the slates, written on the slates, the number is correct, the words are correct, and there is a sentence which is actually a message for someone in the room. The mediums all say Houdini simply demonstrated what they knew, that he himself was actually a spirit medium. Houdini denied the accusation. He said that he was bound by his art not to reveal magic tricks, but he had no problem exposing spirit tricks. And then he shared how he knew in advance the various words and numbers and how he eavesdropped on an earlier conversation and used that as his secret sentence on the slates. In the end, despite four days of testimony from Houdini, his investigators, Madame Marcia, Reverend Coates, and others, there would be no anti-fortune-telling bill. The bill rode too closely to the line of infringing upon religious liberties. Now that is not the end of Houdini in Congress. There are three other things I want to bring up, I want to mention to you, that took place during Houdini's testimony. There was a story that appeared in a number of newspapers on February 27, 1926. It was put out by the Associated Press and picked up all over the country. And it uh, today we might call it fake news. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and read you basically what the newspaper said, and then I'll read from the transcript. So Houdini, according to stories, says that persons claiming supernatural powers were nothing but fakers. And that part is true, and, and it's, again, reflected in the transcripts, though a couple papers put down the word fakir instead of faker, which is something entirely different. Next, many of the stories say that Houdini offered $10,000 to anyone who could tell him what was in a telegram he tossed upon the table. Representative Reed, a Republican from Illinois, spoke up and said, Why, it says I can't be there today. And Houdini replies, That's a guess, and you are not clairvoyant. Reed responds, Oh, yes, I am. And the audience bursts out laughing. 
articles further state that it turned out that the Illinois representative's quotation of the telegram was correct, but Houdini insisted it was all an accident. Wow. How embarrassing for Houdini. This was reported by the AP and went out to newspapers all over the country. There's only one small problem. It's not clear that it happened that way. So I want to give you the dialogue straight from the transcript. It goes like this. McLeod. Is it possible to have a genuine clairvoyant? It is, isn't it? Houdini. It is impossible, I claim. I will give $10,000 to any clairvoyant in the world that will do one test. Read. What's the test? Houdini. Any test that I want them to do. Read. Well, let's get the $10,000. Houdini. Unfortunately, I didn't bring it with me, but I can telegraph for the money if you wish. McLeod. There are witnesses here. Houdini. They will say under oath and swear to it. I tell you, I would not believe a clairvoyant or fraudulent medium under oath, so help me God. McLeod. Would you buy proof? Houdini. By proof? Yes, certainly by proof. McLeod. Here's a witness that can prove it. Read. How long have you been fighting them? Houdini. Uh, about 35 years. Read. Have you been fairly successful? Houdini. I have had more mediums arrested in two years than have been arrested in 70. Because I know their tricks. I know how to catch them. Houston. Have you never tried to catch them on a test, have you? Houdini. On a test, and he turns to the audience, tell me the name my mother called me when I was born. No response from the audience. Tell me the pet name my father used to call me. No response from the audience. At this point, Mr. Houdini threw on the committee table a crumbled up piece of paper. Houston, we ought to know something about the subject matter. Houdini, you asked for a test? Houston, Sure. Houdini. Here's a telegram. Again, turning to the audience. Read that, you clairvoyant mediums, and show me up. Tell me the contents of the telegram. No response. Read. I'll tell you what it says. Please send more money. Houdini. Does anybody want to read that wire? Read. I have made a guess. Houdini. She, indicating one of the members of the audience, is a clairvoyant. Read, I said, please send more money. Houdini, you can make your own deduction, that's just what it is, but you're not a clairvoyant. Read, oh yes I am. And again, laughter from the audience. Houdini, all right, if you're a clairvoyant, tell me what this wire is. Go ahead, producing another telegram. Read, it's asking if you didn't come. Houdini, no sir, everyone guesses that. So that's directly from the transcript. The newspaper record that Reed said, I can't be there today. But what Reed actually said was, please send more money. So they got that wrong. Houdini doesn't admit that Reed correctly guessed the message in the telegram either. What he says to Reed is, you can make your own deduction. And that's just what it is. Then he adds, you're not a clairvoyant. Congressman Reed was making light of most of the day's events, and here's another example. But I don't see where Houdini replies, okay, you guessed that correctly, let's try it again. No, he, he basically says that was a guess. But he pointed out that Reed was not clairvoyant, and really the question was to the crowd, not to Reed. When Reed would not stop, Houdini hit him with a, another test, which he got wrong. Now, I've read the transcripts numerous times, and perhaps... When he says, you can make your own deductions, that's just what it is, could be interpreted to mean, you can make your own deductions, your statement is correct. But I tend to think, if that's what was meant, then it would have been followed by a notation of laughter from the audience, or the audience getting out of hand, because the next line has that. And surely, if someone guessed correctly after Houdini made such a grand statement, the audience would have gone crazy, not to mention the fact that Reed doesn't say anything about claiming the $10,000 prize. And given his antics during the day, I can't see how he would have missed such an easy joke. So uh, I think this is just an example of... Uh, of fake news, the news 
kind of decided, well, you know what, let's make fun of this whole event. And uh, they put this story out there. So it's, it's kind of humorous in a way. Now, there's one more event that took place during Houdini's testimony before Congress. And I had left it out of the articles that I wrote about this on my uh, The Magic Detective uh, blog. And, um, but there, it, come to find out there was a story that came, appeared in a newspaper, November 15th, 1926. So a few weeks after Houdini died, this story appeared. The article was called when Houdini scored and they, they include this bit of dialogue in there. So I'm going to, uh, I'm going to read it to you now rising in committee to answer his critics. The great magician said, my religion and my belief in the Almighty has been assailed. I stated yesterday that I do believe in the Almighty. I have always believed and always will believe. I'm a Mason, and you must believe in God to be a Mason. My character has been assailed. I would like to have a witness. Actually, I would like to have as a witness Mrs. Houdini. And then there was laughter from the crowd. Step this way, Mrs. Houdini. One of the witnesses said that I was a brute and I was vile and I was crazy. Won't, won't you step this way? I want the chairman to see you. I will have been married on June 22nd, 32 years to this girl. On June 22nd, 1926 is when we will celebrate our 32nd anniversary. There are no medals and no ribbons on me. But when a girl will stick to a man for 32 years as she did, and when she will starve with me and work with me through thick and thin, it's a pretty good recommendation. Outside of my great mother, Mrs. Houdini has been my greatest friend. Have I shown you traces of being crazy, unless it was about you? And then there's laughter from the audience. Mrs. Houdini replies, no. Houdini says, am I brutal to you or vile? Mrs. Houdini replies, no. Then Houdini says, am I a good boy? Mrs. Houdini replies, yes. Then Houdini says, thank you, Mrs. Houdini. And then there's applause from the crowd. And the article finishes with this line. It says, Houdini was not merely the greatest magician of all times, but in addition, he was a first-rate man. I just love that the fact they put that in there. And again, it was a couple of weeks after he had passed away, but just a fitting thing to include about the life of Houdini. There's one more thing that happened during Houdini's testimony there before Congress on the anti-fortune-telling bill. There was a medium there, Madame Marcia, who Houdini referred to, he kept calling her Madame Marcia. And it was recorded in that way in several publications, but her name is Madame Marcia. And she made a prediction that Houdini would soon die. And she wasn't the only medium to predict that or wish that. And it looks like in this instance, that prediction, that one prediction, would ultimately come true. Only five months later, Houdini would pass away on October 31st, 1926. So it seems that uh, Madame Marcia, or Madame Marcia, actually nailed one prediction in her life. Pretty ironic. So I hope you've enjoyed the highlights from Houdini's testimony before Congress in 1926, and I hope you've enjoyed episode number seven. If you did enjoy the episode, please like the episode and please share it with others. And if you could subscribe to the podcast, that way you'll find out about the new episodes as they come out. You'll find out about them before everybody else. So that's kind of a great feature of subscribing. Now, episode eight uh, will be coming up, but I can't tell you when, uh, maybe a week away, maybe a couple weeks away. I'm getting ready to go out of town. So I'm not, uh, probably not going to work on it until I get back. But it won't be a Houdini episode. I think the next episode, episode number eight, will actually be a Harry Keller episode. But I can't guarantee that Houdini won't come up from time to time in that because Houdini and Keller were friends. So I have a feeling you'll still be hearing more stories about Houdini. How can I avoid it? So well, once again, thank you for listening to the Magic Detective podcast. My name is Dean Carnegie. I am the Magic Detective, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks so much.